So could we stand, could we put our hands together to welcome and honour Apostle Norm McLeod into our midst and into this house. And um, so God bless you, my friend. It's just been so wonderful having you here. While we're doing that, just prepare to give to, of the tithes and the offerings this morning. Uh, Grant will circulate these buckets. If you want to give by automatic, uh, by FPOS, those facilities are available. Father, we thank you now. We thank you for Apostle Norm and for his beautiful wife, Jess. We just thank you for them. We thank you for their church. We thank you for the movement that is springing out of who they are. We thank you for this father in the faith, this father in the faith that you've raised up. And we receive him. We honor him as a father, as an apostle in this nation, and an apostolic voice to us. We just want to thank you, Father. We just want to thank you for the grace you've given them. And we thank you for Jess. We just thank you, Lord, that you would just so super abundantly abound and bountifully grace them over this next period of time. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Let hell be plundered and heaven be populated through their lives. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. And all the structures that hell has tried to form and shape in the lives and hearts of people that would try and keep them away from you, Lord. I just thank you for the anointing and the grace on their lives that will see those structures dismantled, that will see those structures pulled down, those strongholds pulled down, and the prisoners they've held captive for too long, released into the liberty of Christ and to the knowledge of the, of the goodness of their heavenly Father who has called them from before the foundations of the earth. And Father, we thank you, whose names are already written in the book, but they're yet to receive the message. Father, we thank you for them. That anointing on them to break and set free the captives who have been kept, held captive too long. We thank you for that anointing increasing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. Hey, we've got the same shirt on. You've got the white version. I've got the blue version. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. We're not racist. No, no, not at all. <laughs> that, that one looks more saintly. That one. It's white. You know. <laughs> thanks. Kia ora whanau. Take a seat, please. Can we move that just over there? Thanks. I've got a lot to get. I've got a lot to get through. What an amazing conference! Just incredible. Um, shoo. Um, kia ora. I'm from Gizzi. Originally from Omaru. We went to Pukiori Freezing Works for 13 seasons. That's where. Uh, uh, that's where I did my time. That's where I, where I, that's where my ministry started. Well, actually, my ministry started in the house, learning to be the best husband I could be to my wife and the best father I could be to my kids. That's that's my ministry. That's where my ministry started, and then then it started the freezing works, being the best uh, way cutter on the chain to my boss. That's my ministry, not a title, not in the church a title. It's just it's ministry. So ministry is giving your best to, to Jesus and giving your best to people. That's ministry. And some people in the 80s try to break their necks to get a title. I'm in full-time ministry now. What is full-time ministry? I'm, I'm, I'm in full-time living. <laughs> it's a lifestyle. Yeah, so anyway, um, so kia ora, everybody. Uh, greetings from Jess. Uh, greetings from uh, Te Whare o Te Atua o Turanga Nui Akiwa, the house of breakthrough up in Gizzi. Greetings to you all in Jesus' name. And I'm blessed to be sent by them or to be invited here and to be sent. These guys, amazing. You know, I know you know that. Amazing. But um, and the leadership team and all of the servants. I met many of you last night. And it was just an amazing team. And uh, this is a church of of giant killers. You got you got, you got giants, spiritual giants in this house. And uh, and giants kill giants. And uh, I just want to honor this church. And um, as Jesus said, if I can go to a house, I can release a blessing, a, a blessing to it as an apostle. Now, I'm not into titles, and, uh, but the reason why you need to understand why I'm an apostle is because if you call for a plumber and you want your electricals fixed, but uh, you think a plumber's going to fix it, it, you're never going to be happy with the job because that's not his function. And, but if you think he's a plumber, then that's all you're going to get. You're going to get your plumbing, but your electricals are not going to get And so if you call a, a pastor, 
and you want an apostle's blessing, or you call an evangelist and you want a prophet's blessing, you're going to get it. And so it's just recognizing the functions of God that he gives people. It's not the person. It's not me. I'm nobody. It's the function of God on different members of the body of Christ. And that if you honor a prophet in the name of a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. But if I'm going to honor a prophet, oh, hello, pastor, oh, hello, evangelist, I want, I want to, you know, God's got a divine order. And so when I was in India many years ago, this uh, pastor said to me after two weeks of seeing miracle signs and wonders, church grew by about a couple of hundred, and uh, he said, you are not pastor. Oh, no. You are apostle. <laughs> a pastor cannot do these things. No, no. You are apostle. We honor you as the apostle. I mean, it means apostle. And, and what I rec- recognize, I recognize his honor. He's not worshipping me. He's not worshipping man. He's honoring the gift of God on my life, which opened up his people, and it drew out of my ministry, out of my wairua, out of my gifting, what I have not yet seen drawn out in this nation. And the Lord says it's because of honor. Even Jesus in his own hometown couldn't release the best to his own people in his hometown. But he goes tippy up the road to Capernaum, and there the centurion's not even a Hebrew. And, 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 and he says, I haven't seen faith like this in all of my all of my motu. And, uh, and so honor, uh, honor, humility, and hunger. If you have those three things, you get the perfect storm of God. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's why I just, it, it's a gifting on me. And I want, you know, you get the, receive the best. It draws it out of you. I sit under apostles all the time. I mean, I just can't stop writing. <laughs> Prophets, you know, I sit under fivefold ministries. Now, anybody can, God can use anybody to bring a blessing, but he uses, you know, the ones he's called leaders, we don't worship them. Anyway, got too much work to do. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so I love you guys. You're awesome. Thank God. Ooh, thank God the front lines are lining up. It, is, it hasn't been many on the front line for a long time. <clears throat> and there used to be, they all died. <laughs> they all died and they didn't leave their flipping, they didn't show us how to do it. They just died with their secrets. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, Right here, what is it going to do, Jesus? Okay. Um, just, yeah, I just yield my will to yours, Father. Just your will, your will. So if it's your will, let the wind come. And if it's your will, let the fragrance come. And if it's your will, let the fire come. Thank you. I would have to come to my Hey, I tricked you, didn't I? I mean, the first verse to the last verse. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come speak with us again. So some of you will smell this fragrance, like, and it's just a whiff sometimes, and sometimes it's an abiding, just a beautiful strong, uh, like cassia or myrrh, or actually some people smell like barbecue, <laughs> the fragrance of change. <laughs> might be you on the altar, I don't know. <laughs> it might be Kai. And, and just, it's the presence of Holy Spirit just walking among us. He's so gentle and so powerful. But, um, and so you'll smell him. And if you're smelling him, smelling that fragrance, and if you've got emphysema or lung problems... Just breathe it in, and, and you'll find your lungs will just clear up like that. And um, some of you will feel a wind blowing on you, and then there's fans blowing, but uh, it's a, a physical one. You usually feel it, I usually feel it on the face. And uh, if you feel that, uh, lean into it. Lean into the wind of his presence. Catch the wind like a sail. Catch it. I'm not going to prophesy over you, but you, you can catch your own prophecy. You can just listen. If you feel the wind of God blowing on you, and you just listen to what he's saying to you. I am over spoon feeding God's people. <laughs> Flipping. <laughs> Do it yourself. <laughs> 40 year old Christians and nappies still wiping their butt. <laughs> come on. No more infants tossed to and fro. Anyway, come on, I need to assault people. So, <laughs> and like, like with, I love the body. I love the church. I love the church he's building. And, um, and I take responsibility that I've been an instrument of division in this, in this nation. I've been part of the problem. 
A divided house can't stand it walls, and I've had to repent and continually to watch my heart that I'm not being part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. And uh, I want to be part of a united church instead of you know, moaning about the unity that's not there. Uh, well, how about I try to be some of the unity that, you know, be, be the unity that, that we want to see. Be the, the, uh, the united house of God that we want to be it instead of moaning about it. Now I'm slapping myself. Thank you, Jesus. So uh, my message is, um, you may be armed, but are you dangerous? <laughs> you may be armed, but are you dangerous? You can have all the weapons in the world, but if you're not using them, you're not dangerous. You're just on show. And uh, while I was sitting there, I had this, uh, this thought came to mind that there are some of you here, my, my, my beautiful friends, Fano. And you, God gave you something. He gave you his word. He gave you a story. He gave you a message that can cut down the enemy. But I saw many of you, you put your sword, you sheathed your sword. And uh, you've sheathed it. And you've got to get it out again. It's a time of war. It's when kings go to war. It's not a time of peace. King David, it was a time of war when kings go to war, but instead of going to war... He sheathed the sword and he stood on the battlements and he let lust get into his life and it destroyed him in the season when kings go to war. And if you don't use the energy of God on your life for the season he's called you, it's going to lead you to your flesh and into sin. And the devil will make sure he robs you of the battles you were designed and ordained to go, to go and to win for Jesus. And so don't, you know, you're, if you know who you're ta- I'm talking to, put, take your sword back out. Because so I heard the click. Then I heard, heard this sound. Then I heard, it said, take your sword back out. That's what the whole conference is about, isn't it? Uh, no more hooey hooey. It's dooey dooey. <laughs> um, I was telling uh, the father last night about uh, when I went to, first went to Gisborne, and uh, so there's an area down by Wairua called Uruwera. It's a region. It's where the Tuhoi uh, tribe mainly come from, children of the mist. And I was ministering on, well, uh, let me say, I was ministering to a guy. He came to our church. He came stoned, eh? And uh, he walked into the building, and he didn't realize the door's right there, so everyone is looking at him, and he's out of his head. And my mate Widom brought him along. He said, oh, come here, some good music, bro. Oh, sweet ass. I went, and, and he was. Is this, what sort of music is this? <laughs> and when he was a big guy, he couldn't get out. So, oh, come on. So, poor old Zach went <laughs> down the back there. Uh, anyway, he'd been in pain for years. With and God healed his back. And then I said, if you need to give your life to Jesus, come on forward. And his hand goes up. And he doesn't even know. <laughs> he pulled his hand. <laughs> come on forward, bro. I see your head. And he's walking down like this. Get saved. Goes back down to Taranga. He's living down at a place called Taranga. And um, now with, with us, with Māori people, you know, it's supernatural is normal. And so there are some people know how to move in the dark hearts. And they'll call, command a spirit to get into an animal, an a, 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 a owl, kihua, get into an owl or to a, 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 a possum or a hedgehog. we will come onto the property and bring the curse onto the property, go into the house, bring sickness into the people. Or pūrangi. So it's normal stuff. And, uh, and so <laughs> Stack was there and his flippant owl flew and Walport flew through and, it, and it, that's, that's a sign of death to his, uh, his iwi or his hapu. Nah! <laughs> so he rings me, come and do a ghost bust, please, can you? I said, come on. So we went down and did a ghost bust on the house and there's another guy there. He'd broken his back in two places uh, playing horse uh, polo. So he had plates in his back and we prayed for him and God snapped his back together just like that. He was one of the local drug dealers. He gave away his drugs that, that, that night. He threw them out and gave them away. Went to his brother, who's a Ringatu priest. A Ringatu is a Maori religion. Its prophet is Tukoti. And um, if you don't know anything about that, it's like you can do, do your own research. And uh, so, the, so I, uh, this priest said uh, to the brother that got healed, can, can this fellow come and pray for me? He said, yeah. So I went around, and his name's Reuben. He had broken his tailbone. Been off for it for two years, had diabetes. So I pray for him in his backyard. 
It's not at church. This is in his backyard eating scones and drinking tea. <laughs> no wonder they've got diabetes. <laughs> and uh, God healed his spine instantly. He just felt it snap into place, all the pain gone. So I said, oh, I believe in this Jesus. My grandmother talked about a Jesus that had power. I says, yeah, he's the son of God, the same yesterday, today, forever. I says, religion won't save you. We're at Elam Church. I said, Elam won't save you. Ringer 2 won't save you. Denomination can't save you. There's only a person can save you. His name is Jesus. Or in Māori ihu, ihu karaiti. He said, uh, could you tell us what to say to my whānau? I'm going to go down and tell my whānau. So he's a priest. He's got big influence on the marae. I said, yeah, bro, say this. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me with your blood and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, okay. Can't wait. Off they go. <laughs> True story. He comes back a few days later. I said, oh, how did it go with the whānau? He says, oh, no, no, I don't, I, not too good. I said, ooh, what happened, bro? Oh, we did that prayer, you said. Place was packed, house was full. Oh, people started fainting. And it got so hot, we had opened all the windows. <laughs> you know what we do? What did we do? I said, what? God moved. Brand new baby Christians. When we move, God moves. And those who put your sword back in your, in your scabbard, take it back out. See, if we're not faithful in a move of God, why will God send a revival? Why will he? And we can't create a revival, but we can create a move of God. We can create a, a move of God is whenever you prophesy over somebody, that's God moving through you. That's a move of God. You know, stop looking for the big dead come back to life and all that. Just be faithful with the little that you have. And I teach my guys how to be faithful with the gifts of God that they got. And they see moves of God all over the city. Moves of God are like the fuse that they can ignite to. E. And so uh, uh, what, what happened here? So I went down and, uh, and then we preached on Marais for three years and, uh, and so forth. So many, many people came to Christ that way. So that, that was that story. Um, can we show the first uh, video clip? I think it's... Uh, so there's this woman walking along in pain in India. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm, come here. And, and, and I spoke the word of God. You, know, you might be, oh, but are you dangerous? You can carry the word of God on your head and your heart and memory verse. But you've got to know how to use it to hit the demons. You've got to know how to use it to hit the sickness, cut the sickness off. When Jesus was attacked by the devil in the wilderness, <clears throat> he didn't sing worship. He didn't intercede. He fasted, but he, he said, it is written. It is written. It is written. See, the sword of the Spirit is the spoken word of God. The two-edged sword is the spoken word of God, not the thought word, not the academic word. It's the spoken word of God. And when he spoke the third time, the devil backed off. You can use a baseball bat to smash somebody's hand, at, but you can't use a baseball bat to smash a demon because they're spirit beings, and you need spirit weapons for spirit beings that afflict human beings. And there are many spirit beings living inside of human beings that are not going to come out unless you use spirit weapons, which I'm going to have to show you how to, to deal with that. So, uh, so this is a woman, and she's walking along, and you'll just hear, and I'm quoting Colossians uh, 2, 13, 14, 15, that the moment Jesus blotted out the handwriting of our lawns, which is our sin, the principalities were disarmed. Satan, you have no right over her. Up you get, Amma. Just like that. It's no big, long prayer. Thanks, bro. I think it's the lady with the back. Get out of her back. Release you of all your pain. I release you of all your pain, darling. I release you of all your pain. It leaves you now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lucifer! In the name of Jesus. Satan. Jesus blotted out the handwriting of an ordinance. Thank you, Jesus. Before she was even born, you had forgiven her of her sins, cleansed her of her iniquities, and healed her of her disease. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for confirming this wonderful work today. Satan, you know your claim over her, your jurisdiction has been broken. She now belongs to the Son of God. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, Amma. That's it is up. written. It is written. That's right, darling. That's right. Walk now. Come. No, 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 no. Ah. Better? Welcome now. Welcome then. Welcome then. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Grab Thanks, it. Thanks, bro. Yep. Cup white. Um, 
So uh, I was up at Silverdale, up uh, just north of Auckland, and this fellow walks in, and I thought it was an old mate from the past, an old bikey mate. Oh, cheer, bro. And, uh, but he wasn't. It was a mistaken identity. I did. He didn't know me. And uh, he went, cheer. So anyone want to give their life to Jesus, he puts his hand up. Oh, sweet, bro. So I led him a prayer. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. He went, uh, uh, uh. oh, can't talk. So, but God can hear his wairua, his spirit. So I just kept leading him. And, it, uh, and then he started <coughs> manifesting big time. And then he settled down and did it. And start, you know, by the time he finished the prayer, he'd manifest about three times. He says, okay, it's leaving. It's not coming. <laughs> when you ask Jesus to come, it leaves. <laughs> and, uh, and so he told me later on, well, we'll play the video. It's Steve Brain Damage. Okay, this is my friend Steve. You have, to go, you have to look sideways. My name's Stephen. And it was only last year I could not speak. And since God put in Norm in my halfway, I've been able to speak normally. Oh. I'm so grateful to Norman the Lord. Oh, Jesus is amazing. This is Nige. Hey guys, um, I introduced um, Stephen to Norman last year. Um, when he first came into this church, we had to actually had to drag him through the doorway. Wow. Uh, we couldn't, we couldn't, he wouldn't walk and we had to, he that manifested right? that much. You had to drag you in? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and um, Norm prayed over him and we, the, the spirit left him and uh, now he's speaking and uh, getting better every day. Thank you, Lord. How, how many fits a day did you used to have? Oh, the most got up to about 57. 57 fits mm. in a day. Mm. How many do you have now? Today I've had none. None. Had wow. Wow, wow. Last week I had a couple. Mm. Yeah, that's a huge change. Mm. And your brain was how much had been damaged in, in the, was it an accident? 50%. 50% damage. Mm. And look, you're speaking God's, God's Thanks, bro. It's all about Jesus. So um, he couldn't talk. And um, <laughs> so I go to this meeting and he's there. So Steve-o. He said, Norm, I just had to come and say thank you. What? <laughs> He's talking normally. Thank you for what Jesus did for me. Yeah. Um, I carry cures, incurable cures, or cures for incurable. I don't even know I'm carrying them. I honestly don't. Because it's not even my faith. Sometimes just the faith of the people. And I, I've raised the dead twice. Um, once it was my faith, but the first time it wasn't my faith. I didn't know the, know the kid was dead. <laughs> so it wasn't my faith. It wasn't the kid's faith. I think it was the mother's faith. She's just crying out, and the Lord says she's like the widow of Nain. And, uh, but you've got to have a go. You've got to pray. Don't wait for it to come to you. Just do something. And uh, move. When you move, God moves through you. It's called faith. Faith is an action. Uh, unbelief is uh, inaction. <laughs> we know God can do this, but mm, we'll just wait. Mark 16, 17, Jesus said, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. You'll cast out devils, lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. He said, now go out and do it. And as they went, verse 20, it says, God worked with them, moving through them, confirming their word with signs and wonders, following. As they moved, God moved through them. It's a basic principle. Hear me? As, God, as they moved, God moved through them. When they, if, when they stop moving, God stops. And I find as I move... God moves through me. I'm just as astounded as anyone else at miracles like that. I was carrying the cure for this guy's brain damage. I didn't even know it. But unless I had to go and stepped out, did the dewey dewey, not the hooey hooey. And, and I just want to stir you up, those of you who have put your sword in your scabbard. You need to get it out. Because you're going to wither up and you go to heaven but we're all going to give an account one day what we did with what he gave us. And life doesn't revolve around you in heaven. It revolves around the throne of God, the will of God, the Lamb of God. And as it is in heaven, it's meant to be on earth. And the reason you're swords in your scabbard is because your life's revolving around yourself. Maybe it's revolving around self-pity. Maybe it's revolving around disappointments. Maybe it's revolving around some genuine trauma that you have. But you... But, but in heaven, your life revolves around God. You, I don't belong to me, myself. I'm His. Whether I like it or not, I've got to suck it up and get back to why I was created, to give glory to God, to be used of God, 
to finish the work he sent his son Jesus to do on the earth. That's, and so, so I'll tell you a dream I had a, year, or a couple of years ago about a two-hour dream. It felt like two hours. I got taken all over the, all over the nation, all over the world, uh, and I got taken back into history, way back in time, way back to the days of uh, 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 Jacob. And I got taken into, well, I don't know who this dude was, but I, so Jesus was next to me, he said, and I saw this man in a boat, a Middle Eastern boat, and he had this treasure chest, and he was holding onto it like this, and he's looking over his shoulder. And I thought, oh, he's up to no good. He's got something valuable, and he's going somewhere he shouldn't be. And he, but because he was looking behind him, he didn't see his boat was taking him into a huge storm, huge thunderstorm and waves. The fire, you're going into destruction. And um, I'm looking at this fellow doing this. It was a big boat. He wasn't the only one on the boat. And, I, and, and Jesus said, do you know who he is? I said, I have no idea, Lord. He had a beard. And he said, that's Jonah. I got taken back into history. He said, that's Jonah. I thought, what? what? Why are you showing me? And I know straight away what he's showing me. Jonah's taking the gift I gave him to rescue a city. And he's using his gift, not for me, for himself. And so will happen to anyone who uses a gift I gave them to save a city, a nation, a continent. And they take their gift where they shouldn't be. So will happen to them. They're going into stormy waters. And so I want to say that to you. I'll share that as, as a warning in, in love. You've got a gift. It's not for you. It's to help save a, a family, uh, uh, maybe a town, maybe a city, maybe a nation. But when you just protect it and you're more focused about how you, are cons- how you feel about the gift than what it's meant to be used for, you're heading to stormy waters, and God loves you, but you're heading to stormy waters because He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't be like that miserable prophet Jonah. <sighs> Turn around, because Jesus showed me. Turn around. And, and, and if you are, <laughs> I've got people that should be in our church because they got born again, they got saved, they got mantled, they got fathered and mothered in the house, and then they up and left and took the gift, and they're in some other church. And I'm not into you know, denominational that you belong to me. No one belongs to me. No one belongs to anyone but to Jesus. But they're meant to get their birthright from their spiritual father. But they got all sort of uh, whole heart and, and proud and arrogant. Not, not uh, Some of them. And they're using the gift in other churches, but they're not succeeding. So just be careful. Yeah, if you're more focused on your ministry than your, than your loyalty and your faithfulness to the will of God, you're wasting your time. Use the gift for what it was given. So I, that was part of the dream. Then I saw another, and so I got, I got yanked out of that time zone, whoosh, back to this other time zone. And there's an old fellow, he's, he's half blind, and he's got a white beard, and he's sitting there. And I see another fellow come, and he's got these um, goat skins tied to his, over his hands, and he's got a, a, a plate of stew. <laughs> and he comes in, and, he's, and, his, and his dad says, Hmm, he's come here, son. Hmm. Smells like Esau, As, but um, it's the voice of Jacob. No, Dad, it's, it's, now I see him eating his kai, then I see him bless this guy who's Jacob. It's Isaac and, ja- and Jacob. And, and I saw him blessing. And I'm watching this, and Jesus said, look at this. And then Esau came around the corner, and he saw Jacob, and I saw the eyes of Esau with bukana, man. He said, and he said, I will kill you when Dad's dead. I will kill you. And so Jacob's uh, mother, get out of here, go, go to your uncle. And so I saw, I saw this, and Jacob's like, Forrest Jump, run, Jacob, run. <laughs> and, and he's running through the wilderness. He gets tired, he has a moy, and then he sees these angels coming and going. I said, Fire, he's having a divine visitation at Bethel. He says, Yes. And then he ran to his uncle, and he stayed there for 14 years. He got swindled. <laughs> <sighs> The Lord says, look at this man who I use greatly. <laughs> a man who stole the birthright from his father and his brother. His mother was a liar and a thief as well. His mother's brother, his uncle, was also a liar and a thief. The woman he married was also a liar and a thief, stole her father's. <laughs> 
And then I used him greatly. I said, what's up with that, God? <laughs> you used a line of liars and thieves. He says, keep watching. So I keep watching. It's like a movie. And then I see Jacob just before. And he's coming back to the land of his forefathers. The land of, would you say birthright? Would you say birthright? Please? He's coming back to the land of his birthright. The land of his inheritance. And just before he gets there, he knows Esau's going to kill him. He's coming with 400 men, and Esau isn't as a, he's not, it's not a pulfiri. It's a wakatoa. It's war. I'm going to kill you. And so the, the demons in this guy, they're going to come to kill this fellow. Jacob recognizes and understands his faults, his sin. And he's wrestling with God. But God said, no, he's not wrestling with me. He's wrestling with his conscience. He's wrestling with the injustice that he hasn't faced. He's wrestling with the lies that he hasn't taken responsibility for. He's wrestling with all the things in his life that are wrong. Because unless he wrestles and deals with these things, he will never enter the land of his inheritance. He has to go in now under my tikanga, not earth's tikanga, but heaven's tikanga, heaven's rules, heaven's ways. And I thought, wow, I thought he was wrestling with you. He said, I can waste him like that. <laughs> so he's wrestling. And then finally, Jacob resolves and he gives up on himself and God touches him. The moment Jacob wrestled and took responsibility for all the crap in his life, forgive his uncle for ripping him off, ask for forgiveness for lying to his dad, dishonoring his father, his brother. Yeah, he wrestled with all that stuff, all that inner garbage stuff. He dealt with that stuff. So many Christians haven't dealt with stuff. He dealt with that stuff. As he did that on earth, dealing with the spiritual crap, God released something from heaven to his brother Esau. When you bless those who curse you, God releases something to those who curse you. When you love those who hate you on earth, God releases something from heaven to those who hate you. And God released something in the spirit to Esau, who was coming to kill his brother. There's grace happened, and suddenly Esau softens. And finally, when he meets uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob's in all these gifts before him. And Jacob said to Esau, when I see you, my brother, I see the face of God. And instead of seeing danger, uh, murder, judgment, he says, I see the face of God. And I've had to wrestle with stuff in my heart. I've had to wrestle with disappointment. I've had to wrestle with those who have cursed me. I've had to wrestle with those who have ripped me and my family. I've had to wrestle with this stuff. And you know you're free when you can see the face of God in that wrestling. You can see the face of God. As Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And then he said, I was in the place of God. And in that place of wrestling, sometimes you think, where are you, God? He says, I'm here. Well, where, where are you? I'm here. Be like me. <laughs> Be like me. What? Help me. No, just do what I told you to do. Wrestle with the stuff. Take personal responsibility. Some things you don't need to call the pastor for. You don't need a prayer for. You don't need a prophecy. You don't even need counseling. Sometimes you just need to forgive somebody. Sometimes you just need to suck it up. Sometimes you need to forgive yourself. And, and so a lot of people don't know how to wrestle with God and deal with stuff. Can you see this up here, okay? So um, I felt, yeah, okay. I had demons in me because I invited them. I didn't know Jesus. But I knew how to say to the devil, come into my life. And, um, and from that point in time, I know, I know the place I did it. After a seance, and I knew immediately what happened. My life went downhill, and, and, and just terrible things started happening to me, unexplainable things, supernatural things. And um, death. I want to go deep into it, but it was bad. It was dark. It was very dark. I wasn't a Christian. It was very dark stuff. And, uh, and so these demons got a foothold in my life, and they got a foothold in my life through the pain of what somebody calls me. And in my early days, I had a relationship. It split up. And the wound that that caused me in my soul, the, the, the pain, the, the emotional pain, it just wrecked me. I never felt pain like that in my life. 
It was so painful that I was going to kill some people and then kill myself because I didn't want to live with this pain. And so it got right to that point where that was, that was a physical action that was going to be the response of, what the, of the pain. Um, I didn't kill anybody, thank God, and obviously I didn't kill myself. But the angel was there to protect me. He protected me several times and taken my life. So I flew over to Aussie, and I bought a one-way ticket, and I lived in Aussie for about three years. And, um, but the pain never went away. And while I'm in Aussie in the early days, I get crying drunk every night. You'd never see it. It's me in my heart. On the outside, I'm, on the inside, I'm, I'm just a mess. And, uh, and so I went all through that drama, 13 years of manic depression. But when I met Jesus, a lot of pain left, but that didn't leave me. I'm a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. I can prophesy. I can heal this. I lay hands on the sick. I can do this stuff in church. But I, every now and again, I'll have a, th- a memory about what this woman did to me. And the memory would trigger off the emotion. And even though I'm a Christian, I felt as depressed or as angry 13 years later, as I did back then. So I had demons cast out of me. I had deliverance. I had anointing with oil. I fasted. I prayed. I had hands laid on me. Everything. And nothing worked. This flipping darkness was on me. My pastor said, you, I believe God wants you to be a pastor. I said, nah. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I, I'm not free myself. So I don't want to be a pastor to tell people what Jesus can do. He's done a lot for me, but he hasn't healed. I'm, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not free. And Jesus said, I will free you tonight. Oh, I said, do you want me to be a pastor? He says, yeah. Well, I said, you have to free me. He said, I'll do it tonight. Come down to the park. <laughs> so park was where I prayed in Omaru. So I went down there, and he told me, he says, son, the reason why you're in torment, the reason those demons have got hold of that thing in you is because you, your heart's broken. You have a wound in you. You have a wound in you. Until, until your wound's healed, these demons are not going to leave you. They have access through your unforgiveness to this one that hurt you. I said, oh, no, I've forgiven her. She said, no, you haven't, son. You forgave from your mouth, not your heart. And you can't forgive her without my power. John 21, I think it is, where Jesus came. And this is in the Pentecost. He, after his resurrection, he went, receive ye the Holy Spirit. He was empowering his people to do something. Then he said, whoever sins you forgive will be forgiven. Whoever sins you retain will be retained. He says, you need the power of my Holy Spirit to forgive at this level. And he said, you haven't done it with the power of the Holy Ghost. You've done it with your own heart, with your own mouth. And I said, no, I have. I have. I've prayed that prayer many times. I said, Lord, forgive her for what she did to me. He said, no, you haven't. You've still got bitterness and anger in your heart. I said, no, I haven't. And then he gave me a flashback of her in bed with this guy. And he said, what would you say to her now? And out of my mouth came, you effing slut. <laughs> Don't look so religious at me. God knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going to say before you even say it. And I went like this. And he said something similar. Don't be so religious. He said, be honest. Be honest. You think I can't see this? I'm trying to show you what's in you that you don't know. And I love you and I want it out of you. But you can't forgive her until you get your anger out first and then you can forgive her. I'm giving you a lesson here. Until your anger's out, your forgiveness can't come. Because the anger is uh, 97% of clinical depression is caused by suppressed anger. And though I had forgiven her, I wasn't honest. I hadn't let my anger out. I said, how do I get my anger out? He says, you speak to her as if she's in front of you right now. Don't go and talk to her. Speak to her as if she's in front of you. Because I'm right here too. And you get out and you tell her all the things you've never told her. So I told her how much I hated her guts and I wanted to kill her. And, he, and I felt the Lord say, at last, you're being honest. It's not sin to be angry. But to retain sin and let it burn it will turn to resentment and forgiveness. It can turn into violence. It can turn into murder. Be angry, but sin not. So I'm getting this anger out and it feels good. And after the anger came out, this took about 10 minutes, the a grief, I started weeping like a big baby. <laughs> Snot and everything coming out of me. <sighs> and I said, what is this? And then something came out of my mouth like a snake. Oh, man, the taste was so foul. <laughs> What's that? He said, it's the spirit of bitterness has just left you, son. 
that was defiling your relationships, and that's your grief, and that's your, uh, the grief and, the, and your sorrow has left you. And after about 10 minutes of that, whoa, he said, now can you forgive her? I says, I forgive you, and I meant it with all my heart. I said, I tear up the eye of you. And then Jesus is there, and? Oh, forgive me as I have forgiven her. Do you know that's the Lord's Prayer? When we ask God to forgive us as we forgive others, and if we don't forgive others, He doesn't forgive us. And that allows the tormentors to take, take us. Matthew 18, the guy that owed the king a million dollars, and the king, he wouldn't pay it. Well, he, the king let him off, canceled his debt, and freed him, and terminated his prison sentence. And that guy went and found his mate, owed him 20 bucks, and was, got him thrown in prison. So the king heard about this and says, you worthless servant, I forgave you a million. Couldn't you have forgiven your mate 20 bucks? Threw this guy into the prison, amplified version, with the tormentors. And God says, your unforgiveness was what was tormenting you. The demons had access to you. The moment I forgave, the demons had no more access. There's got to be healing. You know, I cast devils out all the time, but I found I've got to find what is it, what's the door they got in. If you don't shut the door they got in, they'll, cut out, they'll go tippy hiding and they'll find some worse ones and they'll come back in. And so sometimes they just come out like that, but other times, most times, you've got to find the door. And the door is usually some form of trauma, some form of sin. And in this case, it, it was. Me and not forgiving. I thought, shouldn't she forgive me? She hurt me. Shouldn't she crawl across broken glass and beg my forgiveness? Really? <laughs> and Jesus says, and should I, and should, and what did I do for you? I said, oh, yeah. I forgave you and you owed me much more than she did. This is fair call, God. How can I not forgive when you've forgiven me so much? And that's the grace of God on us. How can we not? And so I forgave her, and her, this testimony has set hundreds of people free. Yeah. She has no idea to this day. <laughs> See, you're going to have all the fruit of a tree. If you pluck an apple off an apple tree, it's not going to kill. The apples will just keep growing. They'll just keep growing. If you cut the root of a tree, though, the apple tree, the apples will die by itself. And we've got to find the root causes if there's demons in us, if there's uh, systemic uh, cycles and patterns of curses on our life, stop plucking the fruit and ask God, what's the root? And put the acts of repentance. When you kill the root, the fruit dies. And that's what God had to deal with me. The root, for, for, for um, six years as a born-again Christian, spirit, prophesying, healing the sick, but I had this fruit, this depression would come upon me every time this woman would come and visit Jess because she lived around the corner. Once a week, she'd come and visit Jess. When she'd walk in the room, it's like a little black cloud come over my spirit. And I'd just feel depressed. So I'd bind it and rebuke it. And you know how we do as Christians. In Jesus' name, I'd fake it till I admit I didn't make it. <laughs> I just... And uh, after I went through this process of the healing of the broken heart, when she walked into the house from that point on, it's like I still remember, but I don't feel the pain anymore. And when God heals you, he doesn't take away your memory. He takes away the pain connected to that memory. Luke 4.18, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor and to heal the broken heart. There's anointing that heals broken hearts. There's an anointing to heal broken hearts. We just think of the anointing to heal broken bodies, but there's an anointing to heal broken hearts. Psalm 23, he restoreth my soul. Uh, Matthew... Um, 12 somewhere, or 11, that Jesus says, come and learn of me, and you'll find rest for your soul. Your soul is your mind, your emotions, and your will. It's not your spirit, it's not your body. It's not your tinana, it's your soul. And I find most Christians have got broken hearts. <laughs> most Christians haven't dealt with their soul. They need restoration of their soul. It's, and some of the reasons for the physical sickness is because the soul. Beloved, may you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And if the soul's not prospering, the body won't prosper. And your spirit can be strong as, but you've still got a, a broken heart. And so the, the, I teach this at Worry Activist course. I'll be doing a course down here in a couple of months or so. And, and it's a two-day course. You know, a 30-minute message isn't going to help equip you. And a two days isn't going to do it either. But it's going to give you something to get you off your button out there doing something. <laughs> yeah, ask the ones who've done the course how it's helped them in, in some degree. It's not perfect, but it helps. So, so I just felt, 
you know, as, as you came up to me. I just felt I, I better share that because I see spirits on people, but I know I'm not to cast the demon out because there's a wound there. And it's, it's, it's eating, it's feeding off the wound. And the only way the wound can be healed, number one, is lordship. Number one, I had to bow to the lordship of Jesus. And he said, you're going to have to forgive us, son. Why? <laughs> because I forgave you. Oh. He <laughs> said, okay, true. <laughs> He's either lord of all or lord not at all. And it's lordship, fine. It's the old-fashioned lordship of Jesus Christ. Not my will, but yours be done. Repentance. I choose to the deliberate act of my will to turn away from thinking resentment and unforgiveness. And I choose to forgive that person. The, the first couple of weeks we were in Gisborne, when we first moved to Gisborne, hadn't started church, so I had a part-time job going door-to-door for the census uh, department, taking census forms and so forth. And as I was sitting there talking to this old gentleman one night, He just began to manifest at me and curse at me and swear at me, but blaspheme as well. And I knew it wasn't a human being. It was a spirit being inside the human being, cursing me. And I said, no skin off my nose, mate. Uh, You'll get fined for this. And uh, it's the government you're angry at, not me. But get off my effing property. So I did. But I went back later on and found his wife and got her to fill in the forms. I said, you know, this is going to cost you hundreds of dollars. Just Anyway, um, so... It was about a week after that, I'm in my house praying. As I'm praying, worshiping God, it's like somebody came and put... <clears throat> it's like somebody came and put a wet... Like a wet, a wet sack over me. It was heavy. It was wet. And all I wanted to do is jump up and shout like a madman and run down the street. Going, ah! This thing came on me. Physically, literally, tangibly, it wasn't imagination. It was, wah! And I know Jesus more than, you know, what the heck is this? And uh, Jesus said, you're being cursed. I said, by who? And he showed me the face of the man, this fella. And I wish I could say I was so saintly and so godly, my reaction. Like, <laughs> what? After what I did to help you, you cursed me? Jesus' son, bless him. I said, I want to bless them, all right, with a fivefold. <laughs> I could have been just this, what? He said, bless them, son. So I said, I bless them, and I didn't mean it, but I blessed them. And I know you just keep doing it. You fake it till you make it. I bless you. I bless your family. I bless your marriage. I bless you. And then the real blessing began to flow out. And I blessed him. And then the th- he, his face disappeared, and the thing lifted. And I was free. See, unforgiveness, resentment, it gives access to demons and curses. When I raised him, that was a car pie, it was all fine. Until a week later, I was working with his niece. She said, I can't come to work tomorrow. I said, why? His granddad dropped dead on his doorstep. I said, oh, what's your granddad's name? She told me her name. It's that guy. And I freaked out. Oh, God, I didn't do that. He said, no, I did. Now, some of you are going to struggle with that. Here's the God who changes not. Therefore, sons of Levi, you're not consumed. Here's the same yesterday, today, forever. I, and I said, you're the God of love. Why would you do that? He said, I delivered him into the, into the hand of the master he chose. So I did. And he said, furthermore, son, I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. Now, some of you might struggle with this. It is written. That's why I'm not dead. That's why curses can't touch me. Demons can't kill me. Principalities can't take me out. As long as I stay yielded as a lordship, they can't touch me or you. But outside of the grace and the the will of God, so I like staying under the umbrella. (laughs) You know? So no demon has power over any human being when they're under the lordship of Jesus Christ. There's a guy with 2,000 demons in him in the Bible, Gary and Demoniac. And this guy comes and bows before Jesus. 2,000 demons couldn't stop him from bowing to the Lordship. The human will, God gives us a will to make deliberate choices. The moment I bowed to Jesus, these demons left me. Suicide, grief, depression. 13 years of manic depression went in about 20 minutes. 13 years of manic depression. I had manic depression. Went like that. I'm free. Hallelujah. So, um, So there's some basic... 
Jesus is the author and the finisher. The beginning and the end, but life is not just beginning and end. We are living through the process, and it's through this process on earth, on earth that we're going to learn to let heaven rule on earth as it is in heaven. We're going to learn to walk as we would walk in heaven. So you're in process. You're going to get disappointments. You're going to get defeats. You're going to get victories. You're going to get blessings. You're going to get cursed. You're going to get all sorts of stuff. That's it. That's what we're called to. We're not called to a peaceful life. We're not called to an easy life. It's a narrow path, and Jesus said the way is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. It's not, it's not talking about salvation. That's a free gift. But to follow Jesus as a disciple, you can be a, a believer or you can be a disciple. Believers don't change the world. Disciples do. Disciple means they have discipline, that they're submitted to the lordship of Jesus. And he said, Luke 9, 23, if you want to follow me, take up your cross every day and follow me. Deny yourself. It's not sin or the devil's got power over us. It's self. My biggest enemy is self, not the devil, not sin. It's self. And he said, Jesus, deny yourself. Don't give yourself some self-support or self-ambition or, 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 or uh, what is self-fulfillment and uh, such a consumer sort of perspective. But in heaven, it's not about self. It's all about revolving around his will, his will, his will in heaven. And that's the way to live on the earth. That's the place of victory. So even the battles, I've still got joy. <laughs> I might be forsaken, but I'm not forgotten. We might be smashed, but we're not destroyed. Because greater is He within us. And the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. And yeah, it is hard. I lost my son. We went through 15 months, 16 months of hell. It is hard. But He always leads us in triumph through His Son, Jesus Christ. He does, as long as we stay yielded. So you might be armed but are you dangerous? You might have the knowledge of how to do this stuff, but are you using it? Are you using it? Are you doing something with it? Because if you're not doing nothing with it, you're just armed. Jesus was armed for, he was armed for um, 30 years. He was righteous. He's born into the earth righteous. Devil couldn't touch him. And if you read your Bible, you know what I'm talking about. He came into the earth not born of man, not born of sin, but born of God. So he was righteous. And he flew under the radar. I'm sure the devil knew he was there somewhere, but he, he really didn't either. If he knew, he would have told Herod. Herod would have killed him when he was an infant. So Jesus is born into the earth, and the devil can't touch him, but Jesus can't touch the devil either for 30 years. Think about it. You read of any miracle, any demon being cast out, any work of the devil being destroyed the first 30 years of Jesus' life on earth? No. He was armed, but not dangerous. We're armed with the robe of righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteous, oops, righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay? We're, we're armed. The devil can't touch us because we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, not self-righteousness. By His grace, we are saved. By His mercy, we are saved through grace. That not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. So, so Jesus, the first 30 years, He's righteous. He's armed, but He's not dangerous until He gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. And when He comes out of the water of the baptism, of the water of Jordan, and the Holy Ghost comes upon Father, this is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. Holy Spirit's there. Jesus is there. There's the Trinity. So Jesus, instead of being led into ministry, he gets led into the wilderness, be tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. Ah, oh, what a ministry. I got baptized the Holy Ghost. Oh, let's go and, do, and save the world. No, let's go and deal with the giants in you first. 40 days and nights later, Jesus says, it is written. Jesus shows us how to use. We're armed, but now he's dangerous. Depart from me, Satan. It is written, it is written, it is written. And the devil knows this man's dangerous. He backs off. So Jesus goes to church one day. He normally goes into this church in the synagogue. His old Jack in the, in the, in the pew, he's there every year, been, been there for a, lot, for, for a long time since Jesus was a little boy. And Jack, instead of Jack saying, Oh, kia ora, Jesus, what's up? Jack goes, ah, I know who you are, the Son of God, the Holy One. Ah. He starts manifesting. What's got into Jack? Oh, it's been in him for a long time. It's been in him for a long time. It's a spirit being living inside a human being. 
And you know what? The human world realm does not recognize the spirit realm. The transfer of power took place when Jesus went to hell and took the keys of hell and death. It didn't change physically. The wicked still ruled the righteous, but it changed in the spirit realm, where now the transfer of power, the righteous rule the wicked in the spirit realm. And Jesus walks in, and suddenly the demon that rules the human realm suddenly bows his knee before the one who not is only armed, but he's dangerous. He's dangerous. <laughs> armed and dangerous. And, and that's it. You may be filled with the Holy Ghost, but are you dangerous? You might be filled with the knowledge of how to cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead, but are you dangerous? If you're not doing anything with it, you're not dangerous. You're not dangerous. And I, I feel this is the word, the Sunday morning, this is the word for the proceeding of the conference. You've got to activate now what you heard. Please don't be the bunch. Of, no, you're not. You, you guys are giant killers, actually. You are. But there are some of you here. Get on board. Some of you didn't even turn up to the conference. What is wrong with you? This is not the love boat. This is a warship. This is a wakatoa. It's a wakatoa. If you want the love boat, then go down the road to where they're just saying, Kumbaya, my friend. But this is a warship because there's people dying, there's whānau dying, there's marriages being, cut, uh, being destroyed, there's little kids who are being abused in the middle of the night, sexually molested, while you sit here and pray for them. We've got to rise up, and we are. So, so I'm just going to close on one final thing, if that's okay. I've gone over time. I, uh, how are we going to wrap this up, Jesus? Oh, hey, let's show that other... Oh, oh there, we're going to wrap on that one. Um, so there's different anointings. And I've had to learn how to be faithful to the anointing on me for one. Just for one person. <laughs> my mates at the freezing works. I want to save the world. But if I can't save my, my neighbor, I want to change the nation. But if I can't change my neighborhood, I want to change the world. But if I can't help change a city, get real. <laughs> We're going to have a citywide prayer meeting just for the nation. Yeah, well, you show me the streets you've saved, and I'll stand with you because you've got faith by your action. If you've only got waha and no kaha, I'm not interested. In your, I've been doing this for 40 years now, 11 prayer meetings to save a city. And I'm not against prayer, but I want to pray with people who get prayers answered. You know, I'm looking for new intercessors. I don't want intercessors who pray. Oh, we saw in the spirit of victory. Ah, oh, stuff that. I want the victory here on the earth. I want the dead raised here. I, I want, I want, I've asked God when I was sitting by my son's bed. I said, good Jesus. And I've been walking him for 40 years. I prayed for the sick and seen all sorts of miracles over 40 years. It's wonderful. And I'm grateful to Jesus. But I said, God, I'm broken. Teach me how to pray. I don't even know how to pray. I want to pray and see things done. I want to see things change on the earth. Like you, when you prayed, things changed. Not just in the realm of the vision of a spirit, of the spirit of vision, but in reality, where there's literal transformation on a nation. I want to pray. So I'm looking for new intercessors. I'm going to sack my other bunch. <laughs> I want the real deal, man. So there's this, so I'm faith, I learned to be faithful in the one, in reaching one. The first person I think I saved was in, uh, or Lord led to Jesus in the freezing works. He says, you look different, Norm. I said, yeah, I'm stoned all the time now, bro. Said, yeah, and it's legal. I said, oh, what is it? Oh, I met Jesus, bro. Oh, he, he's a pufta. See, I know, I told you Christians are puftas, but they're not actually. Jesus, is, I told people, Christianity is for puftas and weak people, old people. <laughs> Oh, sorry, did that offend you? <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> and um, I said, he, he's not, and I'm not. <laughs> and uh, he's real. He says, fine, you look happy. How do I get that? I'm, I, I'm sort of depressed. I says, oh, uh, so I wrote, uh, give me a bit. I wrote a little prayer, a piece of toilet paper. When I went down the the paku, my break, wrote a prayer. Jesus Jesus, come on. Took it back out. I said, hey, bro, take this. When your breakers go down the fuddy to the toilet, pray this prayer. See what happens. He's okay. <laughs> so about ten minutes later, after his break, and he's been, it works, it works, Bobby. Boo! I told you. 
It's like you feel stoned, eh? He says, yeah, I feel, it's peace actually, it's not stone, but that's my language. I felt, when I'm stoned, I feel, when I used to get stoned, I felt, wow. I said, it's like being stoned, eh? It's, it's, it's all the time. <laughs> and so I took him to church and said, faithful, use, your, use what you got with the one. Use what you got. You're not an expert. Just, you know, just be full of Jesus and let him leak out of you. And then he, he, I began to use it to more than one and then to, to others and to crack. And God opened doors for me to speak to a lot. And sometimes there's anointing. It, it changes towns. It changes villages. I haven't changed a city yet. But we went to India and we saw a church of 130 grow to 3,000 in seven years. We're now way over 4,000. It's our biggest churches are in India. And it's through signs and wonders and miracles. It's through demons being cast out. This was with Muslims and Hindus and communists. So can we show that clip and I'll close on. This is their deliverance anointing. It makes demons scream. There's something in us. There are a couple of hundred miracles took place in that meeting. There's 600 people. There. The, the fear of God was so strong at that meeting. There are 600 people. Uh, only a quarter would stand up for prayer because they were freaking out. The fear of God was so strong, and they knew they were in sin, and some were ready to repent, and some were. <laughs> it, was, it was cool. So in closing, 30 years ago, um, uh, we were living in Omaru, and uh, down the road from this house, there was this uh, uh, lady with her children. Uh, she had split up with her partner. His par- her partner was angry, very angry. I was trying to lead him to Jesus, but he wasn't that interested at the time. And one night after church on Sunday, he went into the house while one of our church friends was visiting her down there. And he went in with a knife and he stabbed her 19 times. Then he went upstairs to his daughter, where his daughter was. So my friend dragged the wife, stabbed 19 times, up to our house, five doors up, because no one else would open the doors. So we brought her in and uh, called the police, um, uh, ambulance, Armed defenders came. This is November 1990. Two months later, we went to Gizzi. Um, and so the ambulance come, took her away. They said her juggler is 90% cut through. It says three more minutes, she'll be dead. And they just got to her in time. And um, so I went out the back and I was praying. And the Lord said, uh, soon you're going to be asked to go down there. And I says, yeah, I'll go. It has seen angels, though. <laughs> There's a guy down there running around with a knife. But down there, they had the armed defenders, had the guns out, and they're on the roof. They're creeping around because he's at the top of these stairs with a knife, and there was a little girl next door. It wasn't his little girl. It was a stepdaughter. He hadn't touched her. But he cut his little girl's throat from ear to ear. So they didn't know she was there. And they heard the sound of a little girl. They thought, oh, she's okay. So they're standing. The police negotiator's there. The Maori warden's there. And, and this guy won't throw down his knife. He's demon-possessed. His eyes are rolled back. and he's So he's stabbing himself. And I, I saw this in my own eyes. He stabbed himself in the throat several times. The knife that back. And air gushed out in screams. This is demon possession. This is this little sort of... This is the real deal. And I'm looking up there. This is the real stuff. And uh, I said, what do I do, Jesus? He said, um, you pray in tongues real loud. And I said, but what will these fellas think? <laughs> you can be so self-conscious. How selfish. Uh, what? I thought that. And he said, if you don't, someone's going to die tonight. I said, oh, that was, okay. So, I thought, at least it sounds like Maldi. They'll think I'm speaking Maldi. <laughs> and see, what was in that man? was a spirit being inside a human being. The police, got, and I love the police. I think they're doing, most of them, they're doing a great job. You know, the police commissioner, Andy, he's full on for Jesus. I spoke at his, a conference uh, a few months ago down in Wellies. And anyway, so the police, they have authority in the spirit over the physical realm, over human beings. But they don't have authority over the spirit beings that live inside human beings, you see. And this is why the police negotiator had no joy, that Māori warden had no joy. But I, 
there's someone in you and someone in me who has spiritual authority, authority over the spirit beings that live inside human beings. And this is the spirit of murder. And when I spoke, the spirit of God went and disarmed the demon and the guy dropped the knife. I was the first up the stairs. I grabbed him, hugged him. He's got 20 stab wounds in him. Went into the room, the little girl, her throat is open like that. It's just a horrific sight, but the grace of God's on me. Prayed for her. Uh, the doctors uh, took her away. They said she, she's not going to make it through the night. The priest came out after doing the last rites, but we were praying. And the next morning, I went into the hospital ward, and this little girl sitting up, drinking a milkshake, throat stitched up, reading a book, just smiling away. So God, God rescued God rescued her. Did I know what to do? I didn't have a clue. Just move. And God will move through you. If you don't make a move, then God can't move through you. And sometimes you do need to wait and get a divine strategy. I understand. That there's a time and place for that. But in this case, right in the middle, God, you've got to move. And I, and I said, what do I do? He said, do this. Well, it just came as I thought, do this. I thought, well, nothing else is coming. So I'll have a go. And God used it. Obviously, it was the key. And um, now I just got a, a message uh, last week. I've always wondered about this guy, where he is now. He gave his life to Jesus eventually inside. Um, and I've always wondered about the family. I've always wondered about their little girl. And um, I've tried to follow up on them. I can't, for no one knows. I didn't know where they, where they were, maybe the protection thing. I just found last week the little girl that was, she contacted me. She said, um, and so, uh, by the grace of God, I'm going to hook up with her and, and just tell her what a miracle she is and what a plan of God he has for her. Yeah, she's struggling with stuff. She's struggling with stuff. And, of course, she's struggling with stuff. She, says, she said, 30 years ago, a tuhunga prayed over my father and cast something out of him. I'm trying to track him down. Are you that tuhunga? I says, yeah. Tuhunga doesn't mean which doctor. It means expert. So we're not expert Jesus. I said, yeah, I'm the one. He says, and I couldn't believe it. So I just got such an infinity with her. So I'm looking forward to meeting up with her very soon. Maybe the next time I'm down in Christchurch, I'll, I'll go. And, yeah. So, so all things work for good. Um, and that, that was 30 years ago. And I went to, we went to Gisborne two months later. That type of thing's normal. What I saw in Omru, I said, Fire, what's this, Lord? He said, I'm preparing you for where you're going. It's crazy up there, man. <laughs> 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 I don't know how many murders I've been involved in, suicides, call people back from the dead. Amazing. You want to hear about that one? Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, actually, she didn't come back to life, but I went to this house. I was driving down the road. I said, go there quick. So I went into this house, and there's this fellow that I'm trying to lead to Jesus. He's a schizophrenic, and he's on drugs all the time. So he's either, ah, or, <laughs> so, so I knocked on the door. And he asked, he's, oh, okay, Norm, come on. Want a cup of tea? I see you, bro. So I stepped over this girl who's lying across the, the door. So I don't worry that, bro. She's pilled out. So up there, they go on the, on the town. They take, on, take drugs, and they're in a coma for about two, three days. So they just roll them backwards and forwards so they don't drown in their vomit. That's just what they do. It's, their li it's lifestyle. Maybe a little bit different to yours. <laughs> so I, I sat down having a cup of tea, and then I hear, oh, oh I hear, and this woman comes around out of the corridor, black eyes, hair everywhere. I said, oh, that was the Trish. This effing beep, 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 beep was trying to kill me. He was strangling me in the, house, in the bedroom. And I cried, God, help me. He just not oh, no. I said, Fire. You just not, have no idea. You just move. God's moving through you. And he's trying to kill her. But he, he snapped out of it, and he's having a cup of tea. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. He's talking crap. Uh, so we had a bit of a corridor. So I left. As I walked, as I left the house, I stepped over the sister, walking down the down the path, and the Holy Ghost says, "Go back and pray for that woman on the on the floor, that she will not die. Her spirit will not leave the earth till she's washed with my blood and born of my spirit." No, nah, that's not right. Go back and pray for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I says, "John, can I pray for your sister?" Yeah. Don't let her die until she's washed with your blood and born of your spirit. Amen. Keep the pipe. Seven o'clock the next morning, it was about 4 p.m. at Friday night, I get a phone call from one of the neighbors. Norm, quick. Joanne's dead. That was Joanne. 
I said, what? Is the cops there? No one's here. So I rushed around. She's been dead for three hours. Faces rigor mortis, drowned in her own vomit. They went up partying and left her. And I said, because I just come back from India and seen the dead brought back to life. So, okay, Jesus, we're going to bring her back. You're going to bring her back? He says, no, she's with me. She can't be with you. She didn't even recover. She's a gang girl. She's with me. How could she be with you? She didn't do the altar call like at church. (laughs) He said, neither did the thief on the cross. She's with me. I said, I don't understand. But then he said, what did I ask you to pray? Oh, don't let her die. She, she's washed with the blood, born of the Spirit. So, okay. I, so at the funeral, I told all the gang guys, this is what God gave me. This is the only comfort I can give you, fellas. You know, she wasn't a churchy. She's a gang girl. But that's all I can give you. They said, good enough. Three years later, there's her best friend, who was in London at the time, is in our church. I didn't know she was best friends. And she's worshiping God, and her spirit got taken over a brand new Christian. She got, she was like this all through the service. Do you get that in your church? With people just standing around. Leave her alone. See the God or it's not. <laughs> She's not harming anybody. <laughs> and uh, you know, she came out of it and Jess went and said, Oh, hi, what's your name? So oh, such and such. I said, Where are you from? Oh, I'm from here, but I've been in London. I said, What happened to you when you were standing? I said, I don't know. Oh, I've just given my life to Jesus, but it's like I went to this beautiful place and there's a big throne and God was on it, and there are all these trees down this river, and the river you could see right there it was crystal clear. And I said, oh, that's heaven. He said, oh, is that what it is? I didn't want to come back. And Jesus said, I saw on the other side of the river all these people. They're so happy. And one of them was my best friend that, that died of a drug overdose three years ago. And she's waving at me. And I always wondered what happened to her. And Jess said, what was her name? She said, oh, Joanne. And told me the last name. She said, that's the girl you all pray for. So tell me more. So I'm not saying that's a license that leave it to the last minute and God will save. I'm just saying that's an experience that I had and that's the testimony that came back, that God is so merciful. He so loves us. And um, so if I was armed, but if I didn't go to that house that day, you can be armed, but you're not dangerous. There are spirit beings and human beings and God gives us authority to deal with them. You don't have to be an expert. You've just got to have a heart that loves God and loves people. Okay, Father, we just thank you for your presence. Um, I've delivered what I think is what you wanted me to deliver. Uh, a lot of a lot of lot of words there, Lord. So just please, just move the crap that I speak, and just let the gold of your word remain here, and that your will is done, Father, in the lives of this beautiful people, this amazing church, this this ho ha kiti, ho de piti, ho don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. But I feel like there's a big angel in here. And I feel like he wants to take the microphone and shout something through it. And, and, and I believe, I, I sense that that angel is, gonna sp- is speaking through the apostles and the prophets in this house. I sense he's saying he's already spoken through apostles and prophets that hear this conference. And I sense he's speaking every Sunday through people, through, through his, by his spirit. And it's an angel. It's not the Lord. It's an angel. And there are angels. Yeah, there you go. So I just leave you with that in Jesus' name. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Janet. It's been awesome being with you guys. That I could stay for a Sunday, you know, instead of just rushing and rushing out again. Oh, this is awesome. So bless you, Farnet. Uh, you're a part of Alfano. We love you. If you have a gizzy, come and check us out, House of Breakthrough Church. Uh, if you want to do a warrior activist course, uh, I'll keep in touch with your pastors. I'll let them know when the dates are and, and whatever. And So I can only do uh, 20 maximum, but at one time. So they, they sort of go very fast. It's not free. It costs you 400 bucks, but it's okay. It'll help me win more souls in Pakistan and India. Okay, that's what the money's for. It's to send me over there to get the harvest. It's God's money anyway. It's not yours. So, so uh, there you go. Thank you so much, Norm. Just before we go, 
Can we all stand? Can we all stand? Thank you so much. The, the, what, you, what you mapped here was just absolutely fantastic. We teach very similar things because of our own experiences and just, you just, it just really nailed it. Thank you so much. And those testimonies, wow. Wow. <laughs> and I, I could, we could sit for weeks and just listen yeah. to ter- testimonies. Indiana Jones. Yeah, Indiana Jones. Yeah. Indiana Jones. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> but, there be, but, but, but there's people here yet you haven't received Jesus yet. And uh, you've heard Norm speaking and you've heard some stories, you've heard some testimonies. Maybe during the worship your heart was doing funny things and, and or maybe you came in and you felt like you've, you've, you've come home and you don't know what th- that's about. But here, I'm going to tell you what it's about. Uh, there's a, there's a, we ha- God, God is, is Father, His Son, His Holy Spirit all at the same time. It's a real mystery. But what you felt was the heart of the Father for you. You've come home, and home for your heart is in the love of God, is in the love of your Father. And He's drawing you, and He's giving you an invitation to receive Him into your life to cause you to begin life all over again, but not as a human that's just going to mess up, but as His son or His daughter. It's called being born again, a spiritual birth that He does something in us that causes us to Become a whole new person. And so he's offering you an invitation. And the invitation is simply this. That if you admit that you are a sinner and you need to be forgiven. And that you'd, res- and, and that you'd put your trust in what Jesus did for you on a cross. And you won't understand much of that yet. But Jesus died on a cross to pay the punishment for the sin that you've already committed. He did that for me. He's done that for you. And and. What activates that forgiveness, what activates that cleansing is by saying, Jesus, I receive you as my Lord. I put my trust in what you did for me and I ask you to forgive me and I ask you to come into my life. It's so beautifully simple. And so what I want to do this morning is issue you with that invitation. And it's up to you to accept that invitation. So there are people here, just ask the person next to you, look, you know, come up, come up with me. I, I, if you want to come up and, and get prayed for, I'll come up with you. Give, give them a bit of courage. But I'm going to invite you. If that's you, you want to receive Jesus today, I'm going to invite you to come up and I'm going to pray with you. We're all going to pray with you together and we're going to pray with you and, and help you receive Jesus as your Lord and help you receive eternal life. So ask the person next to you. I'll come up with you if you, if you want me to do that. If you want to go up, I'll come up with you, just to give them a bit of courage. Maybe in this section over here, is there anybody in this section you need to receive Jesus today? If that's you, just, just start to come on up. In this section here, if that's you, just begin to, just, just come on up. If there's, maybe in this section, just, just come on up. Just come on up. In this section here, if you need to receive Jesus, come, come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Okay, what we're going to do in a moment is we're going to all pray together anyway. Because I know for a fact that sometimes people just don't have enough courage to cross that line to be able to come up. But we're going to pray now. No, I know you want to, do you want to recommit your life to the Lord? Is that what you want to do? Yeah. What, what, what Norm said this morning might have really spoken to you because I know that there's some things that, yeah, he's talking about you, wasn't he? Yeah, so some things that have really deeply hurt you. And so we're, we're going to be able to talk and, and we're going to be able to, process some of those things. Get a hello, how are you? What's your name? Raj. Raj. Yes. God bless you. Thank you. You want to receive Jesus today? You do. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Anybody else? Anybody in this area over here? Anybody in this area over here? Not too late. Come on up. Come and join this beautiful lady who's responded and nine eyes responded. Is there anybody else? Come on up. The most important thing, the most amazing thing you will do today in your entire life. So we're going to pray together, church, and we're going to pray with Raj. You, you, do you know much English? You do? Yeah, good, very good. Pray with me. No, no, just come and pray with me. Yeah, pray, pray, pray. Just, just join hands. We're going to pray together. How about we all pray this together? Father, I stand before you today. And I've been a sinner. And I need forgiving. I believe that Jesus is your son.
come into my life today. Make me a new person and fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You pray that in your heart? You did. Very good. Prayed that in my name? Yeah. Can I just pray for you? Father, right now in Jesus' name, I thank you for my sister, my brand new sister right now. I just thank you for your presence and your power just touching her life now. Thank you for my night just reaffirming her faith. Touch, just, just receiving you afresh in Jesus' name. Right now. Right now. And if you prayed that online, I just want to thank you for joining us. If you prayed that online, something powerful is going to be happening for you today, from today onwards. Be in touch with us. There's a way of communicating online. There's, this is Sally. You know Sally. There's Leah Van Klink. She's going to spend some time with you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Norm, for being with us. And uh, let, let's just pray one, one last thing. Father, help me go. I am armed. I want to be dangerous. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to go.